Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Greedy Peasant Book Club. Today's choice is really essential to the Greedy Peasant Extended Universe. And of course, I am referring to the exhibition catalog for Camp, Notes on Fashion. Around the office, we call this the New New Testament because we're always referring to it and quoting it to each other, meaning me in the mirror. And I absolutely love this book. I really do return to it so often. I was very fortunate that I got to see the exhibit at the Met Museum in 2019. And I loved it so much. I went back and at the end, I remember going to the little gift shop, you know, and looking at this and thinking it's too expensive. And I was like, no, this is why you work to make money to buy things like this. This is commerce. Just the book itself, I think, is so beautiful. I love having it around. It's this like faded pink with gold. And then on the inside, it's laid out a little different. It has these two sections in this very soft green. On this side is the text that we'll be looking at. Oh, and it has reference pictures to what I was talking about. And then on the other side, it flips opposite. It flips up and it has all these amazing pictures of the costumes that were in the exhibit. So I return to these all the time. Oh, that's just gold. Oop, another gold. Okay. So I thought today I wanted to read a little excerpt from this first section that really inspired me. And I just wanted to read it again because I always enjoy it. This book is curated by Andrew Bolton, who also curated the exhibit. And within it is Susan Sontag's essay from 1964, Notes on Camp. And I remember, you know, hearing that that was the theme and I was like, well, I can't read that essay. I'm not smart enough. I think that's just for intellectuals. I'm going to read it and not understand it and feel embarrassed. And then I went to the exhibit and they had so many of the quotes around and I was reading all of them and thinking like, oh, this is like saying exactly how I feel, but no one's ever put it into words. And so then I immediately went and read this essay and it's so easy to read. I don't know why I was so scared. And it's broken into just notes. It's a long list of all these notes that Susan Sontag wrote. And that's kind of my favorite way to read is just a long list. So I am going to move over to my illuminated manuscript where I have gone through her list and picked out some of my favorites. The essay is available for free online as PDF. I encourage you to read the whole thing it's really fascinating and, of course, beautifully written. Okay, let's get into it. This is the introduction. Many things in the world have not been named, and many things, even if they have been named, have never been described. One of these is the sensibility, unmistakably modern, a variant of sophistication, but hardly identical with it, that goes by the cult name of, quote, camp. A sensibility, which is distinct from an idea, is one of the hardest things to talk about. But there are special reasons why camp, in particular, has never been discussed. It is not a natural mode of sensibility, if there be any such. Indeed, the essence of camp is its love of the unnatural, of artifice and exaggeration. And camp is esoteric, something of a private code, a badge of identity, even among small urban cliques. To talk about camp is, therefore, to betray it. If the betrayal can be defended, it will be for the edification it provides or the dignity of the conflict it resolves. So we're off to a strong start. And also edification, this word edify, it shows up in so many of these book club books. I don't know why that's the word of queer medieval peasantry, but it is. And now we get to start with the list of notes. Note number one, to start very generally, camp is a certain mode of aestheticism. It is one way of seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon. That way, the way of camp is not in terms of beauty, but in terms of the degree of artifice and of stylization. So that's forming our basis. Let's keep that in our minds. Number three, not only is there a camp vision, a camp way of looking at things, camp is as well a quality discoverable in objects and the behavior of persons. This distinction is important. True, the camp eye has the power to transform experience, but not everything can be seen as camp. It's not all in the eye of the beholder, which is something I've fallen prey to, where once I learned the word, I was like, oh my God, that conversation I had was so camp. But it wasn't. It was just like a failure. Note number five, camp taste has an affinity for certain arts rather than others. Clothes, furniture, 
all the elements of visual decor, for instance, make up a large part of camp. For camp, arts is often decorative art, emphasizing textures, sensuousness, surface, and style at the expense of content. Concert music, though, because it is contentless, is rarely camp. Shots fired. Sometimes whole art forms become saturated with camp. Classical ballet, opera, movies have seemed so for a long time. Which I remember reading this and thinking, oh, okay, this is where it started to click. Note number seven, all camp objects and persons contain a large element of artifice. Nothing in nature can be campy. Rural camp is still man-made and most campy objects are urban. Parentheses. Yet they often have a serenity or naivety, which is the equivalent of pastoral. Like an artificial tree could be camp. According to these guidelines, and of course this is her perspective on such a like hard to define concept. Note number 10. Camp sees everything in quotation marks. It's not a lamp, but a lamp. To perceive camp in objects and persons is to understand being as playing a role. It is the farthest extension and sensibility of the metaphor of life as theater. Mm. Jumping ahead to note 18. One must distinguish between naive and deliberate camp. Pure camp is always naive. Camp which knows itself to be camp is usually less satisfying. Note 19, the pure examples of camp are unintentional. They are dead serious. Note 24, when something is just bad rather than camp is often because it is too mediocre in its ambition. The artist hasn't attempted to do anything really outlandish. Note 25, the hallmark of camp is the spirit of extravagance. Camp is a woman walking around in a dress made of three million feathers. Camp is the paintings of Carlo Crivelli with their real jewels and trompe insects and cracks in the masonry. This is another big click moment because I was like, oh, she's referring to this like late medieval Renaissance painter as camp. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Because, you know, he's depicting these very religious Catholic subjects and they're so opulent and they're overflowing and they're too much. But you see him in a museum and you think, well, that's a very like serious painting of a saint or Mary or something. I can't call that camp, but Susan Sontag's like, it's camp. And that's what I needed to hear at that point in my life. <sighs> I'm sorry you're here at my therapy session. Note 28. Again, camp is the attempt to do something extraordinary, but extraordinary in the sense often of being special, glamorous. Parentheses, the curved line, the extravagant gesture. Not extraordinary merely in the sense of effort. Ripley's Believe It or Not items are rarely campy. I have definitely been to Ripley's Believe It or Not, so I love this reference. These items are either natural oddities, so we know nature is not camp, or else the products of immense labor. They lack the visual reward, the glamour, the theatricality that marks of certain extravagances as camp. And that's why I think these like medieval pageants, there are a lot of things, but they are definitely extravagant. It's the best. Note 30, of course, the canon of camp can change. Time has a great deal to do with it. Time may enhance what simply seems dogged or lacking in fantasy, now because we are too close to it, or because it resembles too closely our own everyday fantasies, the fantastic nature of which we don't perceive. We are better able to enjoy a fantasy as a fantasy when it's not our own. I really like that. Note 33, what camp taste responds to is, quote, instant character. And conversely, what it is not stirred by is the sense of the development of character. Character is understood as a state of continual incandescence, a person being one very intense thing. This attitude towards character is a key element of the theatricalization of experience embodied in the camp sensibility. And it helps account for the fact that opera and ballet are experienced as such rich treasures of camp, for neither of these forms can easily do justice to the complexity of human nature. Because if you've seen a classical opera, which I've seen one or two, you know, like, the character development can be very slim. And it is fascinating to sit through three hours of an experience and be like, oh, this person hasn't changed at all. I've changed. I'm now angry and tired. Also, this applies to these allegorical medieval costumes. I mean, can you imagine anything that's more intensely one character than like an allegorical costume for a sloth? Note 38. 
Camp is the consistently aesthetic experience of the world. It incarnates a victory of style over content, of aesthetics over morality, of irony over tragedy. Isn't that a great sentence? Which, like, Great British Bake Off, it's always like, style over substance does people in. But this is like, style is what it's all about. And then I love aesthetics over morality, of course. Because I know a lot of people who really rely on their morality, and they're not even that great. But then they also give up aesthetics. So like, that's not part of my morality. So they're not a great person and surrounded by ugly things. Number 46 is very important. This is talking about the dandy, you know, especially these gentlemen like Oscar Wilde or in the Edwardian or Victorian age who really cared about their aesthetic appearance and how other people perceived them. Susan Sontag writes that the dandy was overbred. His posture was disdain or else ennui. He sought rare sensations, undefiled by mass appreciation. Which this reminds me of people I've met who can't like anything that everyone else likes. This is kind of like dandyism. But us, she writes, the connoisseurs of camp have found a more ingenious pleasure, not in Latin poetry or rare wines, but in the coarsest, commonest pleasures in the arts of the masses. Mere use does not defile the objects of his pleasure, since he learns, he meaning us, since he learns to possess them in a rare way. Camp which is dandyism in the age of mass culture, makes no distinction between the unique object and the mass-produced object. Camp taste transcends the nausea of the replica. <sighs> okay, we're wrapping it up. Note 54. The experiences of camp are based on the great discovery that the sensibility of high culture has no monopoly on refinement. Camp asserts that good taste is not simply good taste, that there exists a good taste of bad taste. The discovery of the good taste of bad taste can be very liberating, and that's how I felt. I felt liberated. The man who insists on high and serious pleasures is depriving himself of pleasure. He continually restricts what he can enjoy, and the constant exercise of his good taste... Oh, I messed up this phrase. He continually restricts what he can enjoy, in the constant exercise of his good taste, he will eventually price himself out of the market, so to speak. It makes the man of good taste cheerful, where before he ran the risk of being constantly frustrated, it is good for digestion. Number 55. Camp taste is, above all, a mode of enjoyment, of appreciation, not judgment. Camp is generous. It wants to enjoy. It only seems like malice, cynicism. Camp taste doesn't propose that it is in bad taste to be serious. It doesn't sneer at someone who succeeds in being seriously dramatic. What it does is define the success in certain passionate failures. And I think that's also a good thing to remember. It's not saying that camp is the best, that if it's not camp, we can't have it. It means we get to enjoy the things that are camp. This puts me in such a good mood. Number 56. Camp taste is a kind of love, a love for human nature. It relishes rather than judges. The little triumphs and awkward intensities of quote character, camp taste identifies with what it is enjoying. People who share this sensibility are not laughing at the thing that they label as camp. They're enjoying it. Camp is a tender feeling. And then very last one, I hate for it to end, but note 58. The ultimate camp statement, it's good because it's awful. Of course, one can't always say that only under certain conditions, those of which I've tried to sketch in these notes. Amazing. Amazing. I really do feel better after reading this because it just speaks to me. And I'm sure some of you is like, oh, thank God. Somebody explained to me what's going on in my brain. And that's the nicest feeling. So I hope you enjoyed that. I really probably read a third or less of the notes, but they're all like that and there's so many great references to vintage films and specific artists that i'm sure you enjoy looking up so i know that was a little bit different for our book club it keeps being different each time but this was certainly our most modern expedition but one that i had been looking forward to for a couple of months now these book clubs are becoming a little bit more sporadic but i want to give them the time to make them really special for you all so i will talk to you all again very soon Goodbye.